Welcome to University. I'm Jeff Rader. I'm here with the co-founder, CEO of Instagram, social media superstar, <laughs> the guy who changed the way that pictures are taken all around the world, Kevin Sistrom. Thank Kevin, you. thanks so much for being with us. It's awesome to have you on University. Of course, I'm really excited to be here. So we wanted to get started with a couple of icebreakers. First, what do you wake up for in the morning? Uh, I wake up to have a chance to meet new people and learn things. What's awesome about Instagram is that you can tune in and see all sorts of things all around the world that inspire you. And we have these people who like, you know, we have a, a user who's in North Korea, Drew Kelly, and he came in and gave a talk to us, um, our whole company, talking to us about North Korea and talking to us about his experience. Carly Kloss, the model, came in to talk to us about how she uses Instagram. Like, my favorite part of this job is getting to meet the people that use Instagram for their specific view and perspective. And every morning I get to work with a group of people that makes the product for those people. So that's what gets me up. Next question. Yes. What did you have for breakfast this morning? That's a good question. I actually, like, I eat a Quest bar every morning. Huh. I'm not an investor in Quest bars, by the way. Do you know what these are? No. They're basically like candy bars that have zero sugar. It's pretty amazing. Like what flavor Quest bar? I get different flavors, but Ooh. this morning was peanut butter cup. All right, so let's talk about the beginning of Instagram, and even maybe before the beginning of Instagram. So you're in, you're in Massachusetts in high school, a prep school, and what were you thinking about wanting to do then? Like how, how did you end up on the West Coast? Like where was your head at that moment, and, and how did it evolve over the, the yeah. couple of years after? The honest answer is I didn't actually know. I, um, I spent a bunch of time studying computer science and just math and technology, and I knew I loved that. I had a passion for it. Um, when I started looking at colleges, I remember going to uh, a certain very famous university um, on the Charles and thinking, it's like the first beautiful day of spring. You know that like first day in Massachusetts when yeah. everything thaws and it's beautiful? Yeah. And no one was outside. And like the people walking around were kind of like ho-hum. And I was like, I can't be in Massachusetts and do this over and over again. Anyway, I, uh, I decided I want to come out here. I studied at Stanford. Um, and in high school, I, like, I fell in love with photography, art history, and computer science. And I wanted to combine those. I actually thought what I was going to do was like be an art restorer, like go around the world, travel, see art, use science to like restore chapels and, and stuff. And I like had that dream, but um, just like everyone else in Silicon Valley, I started a company and, and this one worked out. So yeah, yeah, I'd say. And what about computer science and art? I mean, those seem like very disparate things, pursuits. What about those things really appealed to you? Like. Why were you so passionate about them? I actually never thought of computer science as like a passion of mine. It was an enabler to do other things. So like Got it. I wanted to create levels in games uh, for like, I think it was like Doom and Doom 2 back in the day and Quake. And the only reason I like learned computer science was to be able to do those other things. Um, and while art and, and computer science are fairly different, like. Actually, there's, there are a lot of digital artists these days. I took a digital art class at Stanford that I really loved. Um, it turns out you can use Photoshop to do a lot of the things that people painstakingly do manually with chemicals, et cetera, and photography. And I mean, Instagram really is the combination of those two. It was like realizing that you can write algorithms to change the colors in a photo to look vintage or look interesting. And that's where Instagram came from. It was the like, intersection of art and science. At some point, you go to college at Stanford, and then I, then you worked right, like in the Bay Area, and then yeah. at some point you have to t take the jump from working at a job with a paycheck and to go starting a company. What gave you conviction that that was a good idea? How did you think about that? Well, first I'll say, like in college, I'm not sure I knew what I wanted to do. I am. Um, I think I always knew it would be cool to start a company, but out of college, I mean, Google came along and. I mean, everyone was going to Google, and it seemed like a great place to learn and to work. So I went there right after school, and I had an amazing time. I learned like so much about business, so much about marketing. I just spent a lot of time there. I met some great people. And then afterwards, I uh, decided that like I really had this passion for small companies, and I wanted to get back to that. So given the people I had met at Google, they introduced me to investors. and. Um, 
you know, I had this internship at Stanford uh, at a company called Odeo, which ended up becoming Twitter. Yeah. Um, but the people I met there also helped along the way. It's really like, it's a people game, right? Like the people you surround yourself with over time are the people that kind of influence what you end up doing further on. And I just, I saw so many people starting companies that I was like, seems like a lot of fun. I want to try that too. Wow. And what about the risk? I mean, did you call your parents like, mom, dad, like, I'm going to go start a company, and how did they feel about it? We're, I know that Silicon Valley is a place where you, where starting a company, the, the risks of starting a company somehow get downplayed, and yeah. lots of people get to do it, and there's that pattern recognition that happens, but were you worried about doing that, or were you like, you know, I'm young, whatever, I'll yeah. figure it out? If I knew what I knew now, I probably wouldn't have started a company, mostly because I would wow. have been afraid. So I actually think youth is an advantage. You're like, flexible you're like you can just yeah. bounce back from anything the world is your oyster yeah. you're positive right naive yeah, yeah. It, i mean it's a little bit um naivete but in some ways like that actually works to your advantage completely um for those that want to i actually i'd say there's no time like the present because you're young you can do a lot of stuff and i what i said to myself was at its worst if this didn't work out at least I have a line on my resume that I was like trying to be an entrepreneur and I learned to run a company and hopefully raise some money. And I think that the costs of running business are so low that like you can do that with a relative uh, success, so. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I think from our experiences, it's like we, we weren't always sure what the right answer was or if we could do it, but we're like there's no time like the present. Yeah, there's no right answer. Yeah. And for anyone to say that like, I'm gonna figure this out for sure before yeah. I do it. No way. It was like, so it was so motivating for me too when people had told us we can't do it. Like you, can, there's no way you can do that. Yeah. I'm like really. Well, the number Why? of people that were like, "You're starting a photo sharing startup," <laughs> they're like, "There's no money in photo sharing. Like yeah. no one ever makes a dime in photo sharing. Photo sharing's awful. It's yeah. been done." They're like, "There's been no innovation in photo sharing in the last five years since like Facebook launched, you know, people tagging," and I was like, "Okay, you can read it as like." that means there will never be, or you can read it as that's Now's why we should start it. Yeah. Um, and it just so happened with the advent of the mobile phone and the fact that like you had a camera in the mobile phone and that, that camera became at a quality on par with a point and shoot camera, like that was an inflection point that we took advantage of that not a lot of people saw coming. Um, and did you see that coming ahead of time? Were you like, this is gonna, the world's gonna change. Yeah. Like, the way the uh, photos get, are taken and shared is gonna change. I mean, I definitely had um, a thesis at the time that that was true. The people I talked to thought I was crazy and right. like, it's very possible in an alternate universe I might have been wrong. But just the fact that people were taking more photos and that each and every person had a camera in their pocket meant that there was no way that there wasn't going to be something around photos um, that would happen in in the valley and people starting companies around it. The question would be, can you compete against the big guys? And we were just unique enough and we positioned ourselves in such a way that we were differentiated and people wanted to use it. Um, and that just like kind of started the flywheel for us. So you have this thesis around photos. Is that what compelled you to start a company? Was it the idea like, I should just stop working for a big company and go to start something. It was the or latter. It was yeah. that. So it was no, like it was like I don't want a boss. Right. I just want to do my own right. thing. I want to have ideas right. and I want to be able to be wrong. Um, no, I like I did not like spot an opportunity and go after it as the reason to start a company. Got it. I just wanted to start a company and I knew that like I had enough skills to like kind of prototype but not enough to like really get it through. So Thankfully, my co-founder came along, Mike, um, and we decided to go after a handful of ideas. But the first idea we worked on didn't work. Um, it yeah. was called Bourbon, and it was a check-in app, and it was like everyone at this time was doing a check-in app. It right. was like Foursquare, Foursquare Gowalla, you name it. Everyone thought that um, like hot potato check-ins were like the thing. Um, but we noticed was like as we did that, our differentiator was you could post a photo along with your check-in. And everyone on the early beta was posting square filtered photos. And those posts were like so much more interesting than just like so-and-so checked in at a bar. And we asked ourselves, can we really compete if we just do what everyone else is doing? And the answer was obviously no. Uh, and we looked at what our differentiators were and we just cut everything else and we focused on what people loved about the product. We just felt like photos was like the area to go after. And we had our own unique angle. Um, and a lot of luck. I, I understand how you were different from all the check-in apps now, but yeah. 
what made you different from everyone else who was going after photo sharing? I think like we can break this down in multiple ways. So first, I'd say there's uh, desktop and camera photo sharing. So the old paradigm right. used to be you took a big DSLR, digital SLR on vacation. You took your photos, and then you had this SD card. And some number of weeks after you got home, you sat down in front of your computer, you synced everything, and then you chose the best ones, and you created an album. Okay, That was not our model. Our model was while you're on vacation, you've got this camera in your pocket, and you show people what you're doing in real time. Yeah. And there was a bet that people would do that versus take a bunch of photos and then sync them after. Yep. So we'd like to say we changed the, um, or we didn't change the tense of photo sharing, but we certainly went after the present tense rather than the past tense. This is what I did on vacation was like kind of the, the paradigm that exists. This is what I'm doing on vacation was the thing that we wanted to tackle. So that was kind of the first thing that we did. The second uh, way we differentiated, because there were people doing real-time photo sharing on the mobile, mobile device at the time, yep. we, um, we decided to ask ourselves what the three most important components were for photo sharing to succeed. Number one, it had to be fast. If you used any photo sharing app at the time, like super clunky, they were uploading like one or two megabytes over edge connection, it was taking forever. So one of the you know decisions we made early on that like basically still sticks to today is we Best. decided square photos and we only uploaded the bits that needed to be displayed on the device and we pre-uploaded. So like the second you took the photo, we started uploading in the background, even if you cancel out, so that like when you decide finally to upload, it was like instant. And I feel like that felt like magic to people because they were used to really slow uploading. The second was beauty. We looked around and we said like, all of these photo sharing sites that are doing it on mobile right now, like the photos look kind of crummy. And that's because you know lenses at the time were kind of crummy. So what could we do to get over that? And my experience with Holga cameras, these little plastic cameras, they didn't take the best photos, but like if you developed the film in a certain way and added the right chemicals, it gave it like a very cool retro look. Yeah. And I was like, we can do that digitally. So let's invest in making these things beautiful and interesting. And then the final differentiator was just- Which were filters. Uh, that was filters, yeah. the beauty side. And then the final differentiator was like, I call it the like Lord of the Rings uh, uh, strategy, which is one ring to rule them all. If we can have the camera that lets you post to all of these networks all at once, then everything flows through us. At the time, if you wanted to share a photo, you'd open up Tumblr, you'd open up Twitter, you'd open up Facebook, and it was just like, God, I have to like upload that. So you wouldn't do it. But if we had the ability to just like take a photo, share it on Instagram, but as a side effect, tick a couple boxes to also share it to other places. Not only do we get content coming onto Instagram, but we get basically free advertising of what this app does on every other network in the world. So that also helped us grow. Because people would go, how cool, like how'd you take that square filtered photo? So it became viral advertising for Instagram. And uh, the model just clicked, like speed, beauty, distribution. And I like tell every entrepreneur, like, if you don't have like the three things you're focusing on in your company, um, you're not going to survive. So you figure out the three things that really differentiate you: fast filters and sort of distribution everywhere. Yep. And um, how long did it take you to figure that out? Was that something that you did over six months or a year, like, or no, was it just no. like we figured this out fast and we had to move quickly? Well, the exercise we did, we sat, I still remember the exact room in Dogpatch Labs. Dogpatch Labs was a co-working space over this pier, or it was on a pier over the bay in San Francisco. And we were in this little room and we had a whiteboard and we wrote out like, what are the things that people love most about Bourbon, the app we were working on before. Photos was at the top of the list. We circled that, crossed everything else out. And then we were like, okay, what are the three key things that matter in photo sharing? And we just started talking to each other, me and my co-founder, Mike. We were like, well, what do we hate about like these other apps? It's like, God, they're slow. All right, speed. We care about speed. Yeah, like real photos from these cameras that aren't modified in some way, it's got to be beautiful, beauty. And then we asked ourselves, OK, if we're fast and we're beautiful, how do we get distribution? Like differentiation isn't, um, if you just like build an app that's different right. and no one discovers it, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So we needed a, a strategy. Tree falling in the woods. Yeah, we need a strategy that allows us to have distribution. If you figure out a compelling um, reason for the consumer to help you grow virally, that's like the best, uh, the best combination and the best strategy. You're like, okay, we got it. 
we're going to build the most amazing app, photo sharing app that's ever been built in the history of the world, which you've done. Congratulations. Um, what, how, what happens next? You just say, we're going to drop bourbon, go focus on this. Well, how does that? How does that? How does that all come to be? How does Instagram come to be? We definitely didn't think we were going to build the best photo sharing app in the world. We were just like, this seems we're like we're going to solve problems. We were like, the other thing's not going anywhere, so we clearly have to do something else to survive. But what's weird is like, we had maybe a hundred people using Bourbon who loved it. They loved it, but every new person on the outside we gave it to was like, what is this? Like, why would I use it? So you can get trapped and only pay attention to the people that like are your early adopters who love something. And each one of them, when we showed them Instagram, they were like, ah, I probably won't use this. And like, actually, a good number of them still don't today. Even though we have over 400 million people in the world that use it actively, Crazy. like those people still are like, yeah, it's just not for me. So you can like get held hostage by your initial consumers if you're not really thinking more broadly. And we just had to have the conviction. Because a lot of people were like, why are you working on this thing? Like, Keep working on bourbon. Instagram is going to go nowhere. Photo sharing is going to go nowhere. You have to have conviction and you just have to go with it. And you know that gets harder, by the way, as a company gets bigger. When you're two people, you can make a decision like that and go. But I mean, the innovator's dilemma hits every single large company because they have to continue to make hard decisions like that. Yeah. But they've got an entire installed client, or like user base or client base, and they've got employees who are like, what are you doing ruining my job or changing my job? So that's like true leadership is continuing to do that over time. Uh, it is so hard because you're afraid. You're like, oh God, I got a lot to lose now. Yeah. As opposed to, I mean, 100 users, whatever, 400 million, you have a lot to lose. A lot if to, you, you, to if, lose, yeah. But if you don't continue to be bold. We talk a lot, and my co-founder at Harry's and I, Andy, talk a lot about trying to do what we would do if we just knew we were going to succeed. Because mm -hmm. that's how we felt at the beginning. Like, we got yeah. nothing to lose. We're, no, we're, let's nothing. just let it rip. I think it's um, it becomes more calculated over time. Like, you just have to figure out ways of reinforcing the business that you work on, and then also a portion of like just experimental stuff that sometimes won't work out. We've definitely launched apps that like don't work out, and then we launched like a way to combine photos called Layout, and it's like in the top charts of the store for the last four or five months. It's crazy. Imagine the feeling inside this company when we were like, guys, we're gonna allow non-square photos. Everyone was like, are you crazy? Like, that's what makes Instagram Instagram. I mean, the number of articles that were posted day one when we launched non-square photos that were like, they ruined Instagram. <laughs> and like, I get it. Some people really did feel that way, and I understand why they felt that way. At the same time now, you've got like 20% of photos on Instagram are posted non-square, cool. and they love it. So it's like you have to be able to break the things. Yeah. And what gave you conviction to make that decision? Well, people were doing it already. They were just doing it with like plugins. So we saw the behavior exist, um, and there were white bars on the side and on the top, and it just made feed feel feed on Instagram feel kind of clunky. So we were like, all right, this is clearly a thing that's not going away. What can we do to address this and make it awesome? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, every decision you make in a company at this scale, it becomes harder and harder. But that's why you just have to be a leader and like understand in your gut what like your values are and. Square photos is not one of my values. Like expression is. So if people want to share the way they want to share, like we're gonna make it happen. That's cool. It also feels like you've been putting people first for a long time. Yeah. Like, hey, people want this in a photo sharing app. I'm gonna go create this. People want to share non-square photos. I'm gonna go enable that to happen. Yeah. The best business models in the world are the ones where you like ask people what they want and they tell you and you go and you build it. Yeah. And like every now and then you have to read between the lines because no one at the beginning of Instagram was like, I want a photo sharing app. No one. In fact, very few people. <laughs> um, but when we built it, they were like, oh, wait, wait, wait. No, I don't want a photo sharing app that just does what I know photo sharing apps do. I do want a photo sharing app that makes my photos look cool. And when you thought about building the company that you had to build to support the explosive growth that you were seeing, what were the two or three things that you felt like were just the most important things you had to do or decisions you had to make early on to set the company up for success long term? Hiring the right people was like absolutely key. And what did you look for in those people? You know, I think, I'll tell you what we were looking for and I think it was a mistake. I think we were looking for people who were like exactly like us. It was like young, like really into the things we were into, whether it was like, you know, beer, bourbon, you know, hipster music, coffee. Um, that like, that helped because like we had a really tight culture early on. 
But one of the things I love about our company now is, I mean, you have people from so many different backgrounds, different ages, et cetera. And like the diversity and perspective really helps you grow now. So I don't know. I mean, there are theories that when you're a small company, you really want to have kind of like a, um, a monoculture. But as you grow, you need to diversify. I wish we had diversified more quickly, and I wish we had grown more quickly. What's a Kevin Systrom interview like? A Kevin Systrom interview? Yeah. From your perspective or from mine? Uh, oh, good question. Uh, from my For perspective. For a job interview. Yeah, a job interview. Yeah. It totally depends on the position. Uh, often I just want to ask or I want to find out what drives people. Um, some people are really driven by money, and I don't think that's a bad thing. It's just like not usually a fit here. Some people are really driven by like wanting to make the world a better place. Some people are really driven by um, wanting to learn. Like what drives people? Like what gets them up in the morning? What like, where does the fire come from? Because like the best people in the world just have a fire about something. Not about everything, but about something. You mentioned that you had 13 people and then you sold the company to Facebook. Um, what is it like managing a company that's growing, that's your company, versus working on continuing to expand the impact of the company or the product than a much bigger organization? I'm not sure I can remember much about Instagram as an independent company that applies today. Like, we were around for two years, but it was like six of us in a room for most of the time. I mean, right. we hired six of those 13 in like the couple months leading up to the acquisition. So it was like we were tiny for a long time. Now we're basically like 300 people. And when you can't count all the people we interact with, the salespeople, et cetera, legal, HR, finance, that help support us, we're probably effectively six or 700 people by the time you're done with it. That's just a different job. I mean, it would be a different job if we were a six or 700 person company independently. I went from like working on product ideas to like making sure that we had the people to work on the product ideas and navigating like large scale strategy questions about like how we fit into the overall Facebook strategy and people are like, how do you like stick with it, et cetera. And it's like, well, cause my job changes every year. Um, I'm always working on something new and different and the challenges are different. I have a bunch of questions from students wanted to jump in. The first is from Genevieve from McGill. Um, and Montreal. Montreal. Um, and her question was, at what point, and I think we kind of got into this, but at what point did you feel like Instagram was at a tipping point? I mean, honestly, the first day, okay. um, seeing the volume of people that came in. We had 25,000 people sign up day one. Whoa. And the previous startup I was at for like a year, we had maybe like 10,000 people total, 10,000 accounts total. And I thought that was like a really big number. I mean, if I say 10,000 to any person, they're like, right. that's a big number. So 10,000 people, I was like, all right, that's my like high water mark. 25,000 people, day one, I was like, Mike, I think we created something. I like, I don't know what, I don't know like where it's gonna go, but there's like a, a spirit, you know, you can like feel it, you can feel the momentum. And it, maybe I was just delirious, but I didn't think it was gonna go away anytime soon. Leon from University of Maryland uh, asks, uh, do you feel that Instagram is being used for the purpose you intended? That assumes that there's one purpose. Um, I mean, the way teens use Instagram is so different than the way I use Instagram. I'll give you an example. Some crazy number of photos are deleted every single day, especially among teens, because they keep their profile relatively uh, curated. I don't remember the last time I deleted a photo. Maybe when I like accidentally edited it or something and I wanted to change one of the photos I had uploaded. But like, I don't edit my profile in the same way. So people use it in very, very different ways. And we have this entire research team that goes out and just like talks to people. And we figure out how do you use this product differently than this group, than differently than this group. And then we build specific solutions for those different groups. So um, no, I mean, every single day that goes by, it surprises us how people use Instagram. Allie from George Washington asks, when starting Instagram, did you initially target anybody in particular, professional photographers, editors, like? Yeah, for sure. I mean, like setting up on the side of the road and just having a sign saying, hey, Instagram, go download it, is like not a winning strategy. Initially, we were like, we think this is going to be really big with creatives. So I emailed like 100 people that were on this list of like 100 designers, people that do web design and photography and stuff. And we got each and every single one of them to sign up for the beta. 
And the good news is that they actually responded and they actually liked the app. Had they not liked the app, we would have been in a tough spot. But we got most of them on. And given that we had their, that concentration, they all talked about it. And then their friends talked about it. And their friends talked about it. And it grew and it grew. So it's just like a magnifying glass trying to start a, uh, a fire with a magnifying glass. Like You have to focus on a specific group of adopters that A, want your product, and B, reference each other, and C, other people watch them. So if you can do those three things, I think you can have a strategy for growth from the beginning. And as you think back in the history of Instagram, are there one or two individual Instagrams, photos, that stick out? The most meaningful Instagram that sticks out to me is the first Instagram ever, uh, which had I known it was going to be the first photo, I might have like tried a little harder. Um, it's of my fiance's foot and a stray dog uh, in Mexico. And it's because we were, were on a vacation in Mexico. We had been working on that initial app called Bourbon that I told you about for a while. And it just wasn't going anywhere. And I was like, all right, I need a break. I need to like relax and, and clear my mind. And in Mexico, that's where we came up with filters. Um, because I was walking along the beach with her, and we were talking about this new app, Instagram, that we were working on. It didn't have filters at the time. And she was like, yeah, I probably won't use it because my photos aren't that great. Like, all your friends post these beautiful photos. I can't keep up with them. And I was like, well, you know they all filter their photos. And she goes, oh, you should probably add filters. So I was like, OK. We raced back to the house. And I remember using the dial-up internet in Mexico at the time to like research how to make these filters. And the first photo I took with the filter, I was just testing the app. I was out. And uh, Mike had been like, he emailed me and said, oh, hey, hey you can post now. It works. And I happened to be out, take a photo with X Pro 2, which was the first filter I made. And that ended up being kind of the, that was the first Instagram. And it just stuck. So uh, anyway, well, it's still there today. A lot of people like scroll all the way back in my profile and find it and comment on it. Uh, but it's really meaningful to me because I think it was like a, a turning point for Instagram. Well, Kevin, it's been amazing to have you. Thank you so much. We hope you guys all really enjoyed this. Um, uh, this was inspirational for me. I imagine it was inspirational for all of you guys. So thanks so much. Thanks for having me.